Okay, so our speaker today is Renee Conroy, Associate Professor of Philosophy here at PNW, and she's uh, a world-renowned expert on aesthetics, especially the philosophy of, of dance. Um, and today uh, she's speaking. Renee, what is your ti what is the title of your speech? Uh, Fallen Monuments, the Aesthetics of Resistance and Remembering. Very good. And so before I ask you to start, let me say, uh, if you have questions for Renee as she's speaking, put those in the chat and then we'll deal with those uh, when uh, she completes her talk. So having said that, Renee, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Renee Conroy, everyone. Thank you so much, David, for that lovely introduction. And it's wonderful to see all of you here on a midweek afternoon. Um, today's presentation is going to work in a variety of modes because I know that Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Uh, so I'm going to do a little talking, then I'll show you some film, then I'll make some comments on it, then I'll show you some more film, then I'll invite you into discussion. And my contribution with the film aspect is probably going to be about 45 minutes, so hopefully that will leave us with 20 to 25 minutes for group conversation, which is really my aim in this presentation. Um, also, just in the interest of staying on track with time, I'm going to go ahead and read my remarks, but I'll try to do it in a way that's inviting. And because I'm working between PowerPoint and YouTube, there will sometimes be a little bit of a technical delay as we go to the optimized versions of these things. Uh, so we'll start with PowerPoint and the first share screen move. And here we go. So today's presentation is precipitated by ongoing public debate over civic iconography, which has gained new momentum in the wake of the Charleston church mass shootings in 2015 and the events that transpired in Charlottesville in 2017. It reached, I think, a critical tipping point this summer during the nationwide protest following the death of George Floyd. My talk is entitled Fallen Monuments to highlight a variety of ways public images of the past may undergo important transformations and call for community discussion. Some of these have fallen physically from their plinths. All have fallen from civic favor because they can no longer achieve a productive communal function. And thus all cause us to, as one historian put it recently, fall into battles about culture, even as we're fighting a more fundamental war about human rights and dignity. Today, cities across the country are actively confronting a variety of complex questions at the intersection of ethics, aesthetics, politics, and history about how to appropriately represent a public's past, present, and future in civic spaces. My reflections are motivated specifically by a new project Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfield introduced on August 2020, which is called the Memorials and uh, Monuments Assessment Project. According to the charter, the project has four main objectives, including cataloging monuments and public art on city or sister agency property, appointing an advisory committee to determine which pieces warrant attention or action, and that's already been done, making recommendations on any new monuments or public art that could be commissioned, and creating a platform for the public to engage in a civic dialogue about the Chicago's history. And I will note that I have read that preliminary versions of their first reports from the advisory committee are supposed to be made public in December. So I'm very much looking forward to reading them. This new team is part of Mayor Lightfoot's response to the increasing conflict surrounding a number of historical sculptures in and around Chicago, particularly precipitated by two statues of Christopher Columbus in Grant Park in Little Italy, uh, and later to be followed by a third. These were temporarily removed in the wee hours of the morning on July 24th in response to the increasing unrest their continued presence was facilitating. This focus on Columbus was not merely a local phenomenon, as many similar statues were toppled or vandalized nationwide this summer. But it did mark an important shift from the sculptures that had previously garnered the most attention for fomenting contemporary controversy, namely those that represented Confederate leaders or apologists, most notably Robert E. Lee. Over the summer and into the fall, a variety of representational sculptures in Chicago's public places and across the country have been used as a canvas for expressing resistance to various forms of injustice and systematic inhumanity. 
And a quick Google search evidences the range of spaces and places that have been affected by this phenomenon. As a result, cities nationwide, including San Francisco, Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, have created new groups for assessing how these cultural artistic flashpoints should be addressed and are pouring substantial support into grassroots arts organizations and local art projects to both respond creatively to the current moment of vacant plinths and damaged sculptures and to generate new ideas for the future of our cherished public spaces. Now, before I dive into the meat of my presentation, which will be structured around a recent documentary I'll share with you in these viewing sessions as a way to start a conversation about how Chicago's new public art commission should proceed in its work, several caveats and notes of clarification are in order. The first is methodological. Broadly speaking, there are two well-recognized well kinds of philosophical projects, the argumentative and the reflective. So these need not be mutually exclusive and they're often mutually supportive. And while it's typical for me to pursue an argumentative project in a talk of this sort, I will not do so today. There are a number of reasons for this choice on my part, but I'll confess that the primary one is I'm not exactly sure what thesis one should defend or exactly how she should defend it with respect to the civic challenges as thorny and important as dealing with controversial and potentially harmful public images. There are so many intersecting concepts and legitimately competing values that must be carefully teased apart to clear the ground for any rigorous philosophical work that I'm forced instead to pursue a purely reflective task that surveys the relevant territory and asks, what are the important questions here? What assumptions do we bring to bear in answering them? What distinctions need to be made to ensure the most judicious and responsible civic conversations in this domain? Hence, if there is a thesis for which I'll argue implicitly, it's simply that the activities to be undertaken by groups such as Chicago's Memorial and Monuments Assessment Project should be buttressed by this kind of philosophical reflection and should never forget to give aesthetic considerations and theories their proper due, even if this might be relatively small in the end. The second caveat has to do with the scope of my reflective intentions. First, I leave aside issues about what one might call the ethics of vandalism. I'm neither condoning nor criticizing the expressive activities of citizens who've utilized public sculptures as a kind of canvas for their messages of resistance without having official sanction or invitation to amend these creations. Instead, I'm primarily interested in two questions that arise only after some such artifacts have been modified by citizens' hands. First, what should we do with the altered representations once they have been changed? And second, how should we regard the family of practices associated with American monument making in the future? Furthermore, I'm less interested in suggesting what kind of monuments from the past should be maintained or what the monuments of the future should look like, but in canvassing an array of considerations and creative possibilities that are available for decision makers to explore. So what will emerge by the end of today's reflections are not specific recommendations from me about the right kinds of public art to pursue at this moment, but rather a preliminary set of tools for thinking about monuments and other pieces of civic iconography, given their multifaceted nature. With caveats in mind, I now invite you to watch a brief documentary created by New York's American Museum of Natural History as part of a recontextualizing pro uh, project that was entitled Addressing the Statue and was initiated several years ago. It concerns a controversial sculpture of Theodore Roosevelt unveiled in 1940 that was designed originally to be displayed on the museum's steps, putatively to honor his naturalist agenda and also to pay homage to his contributions to the development of the museum itself. In the effort to avoid spoilers, I'll turn now to the video without much further commentary or introduction, which I will show in two parts, breaking halfway through to distill some lessons and questions from the first half of the film that at least are raised for me and then inviting you to do the same upon our viewing of the second half. The purpose of considering a non-local example is to shine light on the complexities that will undoubtedly attend future conversations undertaken by the newly formed Chicago Commission, as well as to generate a list of aesthetically oriented topics that call for philosophical attention as these discussions unfold between civic leaders, artists, academics, and community members. One final introductory note, this presentation is undertaken in the spirit of my philosophical teacher and mentor, Ronald Moore, 
who used to begin his capstone courses on philosophy and public policy by having students respond to a thought experiment in which they were the policymakers on some challenging issue. And he forced them to do so before they read any philosophical text that might inform or change their pre-reflective analyses. Hence, I invite you to ask yourself, as you view this brief documentary, what aesthetic issues deserve attention? What art-related assumptions are being made? And what conceptual distinctions need to be parsed more fully for a community of diverse stakeholders to have a productive conversation about fallen monuments? And I would also urge you to jot these down so we can reflect on them together at the end of my remarks, which represent only my personal reactions as both a philosopher of art and a concerned citizen. Uh, so now we have the first technological transition uh, to the documentary associated with this project called Addressing Statue, and it's entitled The Meaning of a Monument. Each year, nearly five million people visit the American Museum of Natural History. Most pass by a controversial statue memorializing former governor of New York and U.S. President Theodore Oops. Oh, my apologies. We will make it work. Roosevelt. It's hard to get perspective on the statue. You really have to be standing in the park across the street to actually get much perspective. And when you do, you see this kind of heroic figure on top of the horse. Teddy Roosevelt, as we've come to know him and love him, with a bandana and his Rough Rider kind of gear. And then there's the two figures, which I think many people miss, in this Indian figure on one side, an African figure on the other. But there's something that's itchy about this statue that rubs us the wrong way, that's just not quite right. When I started to look at the statue, I was just paying attention to the horse. I was just like, oh, a horse. But then I started paying attention to the people and I was like, oh, like there's one person at the top and then the other two are at the bottom. It's a beautifully rendered equestrian statue, but the symbolism of the statue is always problematic. The first impressions of the statue are that it's a magnificent piece of work and that it's massive. It's a reminder of this country's history and what we don't want to talk about. It solidified what happened to some of my own ancestors. It could be See, that's a friendship, I don't know. It looks good right in front of the museum also. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, you know. It's a nice, it's a nice, like you can take nice selfies. The fact that the African is naked or practically naked, we're calling them a primitive society. I know it hurts a lot of my people in particular. It hurts a lot of minorities in general. People have protested the statue for decades. And today, these voices are intensifying. We're here to show our dislike for that statue and say our demands that we wish for it to come down. When I look at the statue, I do see a commentary about white supremacy. It has acquired that reputation as being um, a monument to uh, racial supremacy. It represents a racial hierarchy, and it pains me that that might be part of the experience entering the museum. The fact that monuments and memorials in New York are controversial isn't new. They often become, because it's public space, sites of protest, places to rally, places to celebrate. That is the role of public space. It's a space of contestation. Statues are powerful things, and we're taking a hard look at our history and how do we deal with that. After Roosevelt died in 1919, the state of New York set out to create a memorial to honor him as a nature lover, explorer, and author of natural history. The state of New York wanted to memorialize TR as one of the great New Yorkers. It made sense to the Museum of Natural History because the Roosevelts had such a great history here. Our charter was signed in 1869 in his father's parlor. He was a blue blood kid from an aristocratic New York family who goes on to live rough on the range as a kind of cowboy. 
There's the Rough Rider legacy of him on San Juan Hill that makes him a war hero. At the time, he was a larger than life adventure hero type of figure. Yes, he was a naturalist. Yes, he was a kind of explorer, but he was also the president. He is our great conservation president. During his tenure in office, he saved over 234 million acres of wild America, places like the Grand Canyon, Mirror Woods. This is part of the enduring legacy of Theodore Roosevelt. Architect John Russell Pope won a competition to design the memorial at the museum, consisting of a new building, murals, and other works of art. Sculptor James Earl Fraser was chosen to execute Pope's vision of the statue, which was unveiled in 1940. Pope specified an equestrian monument, Roosevelt on the horse, and two figures standing next to him. And the entire group, not just Roosevelt, was intended to be heroic. The allegorical figures, and these are Fraser's words, may stand for Roosevelt's friendliness to all races. The figures represent the continents on which he hunted as either gun bearers or guides or both. People refer to this figure as an African-American. That's totally impossible. We know he represented the continent of Africa. The African figure is conjectural in a way. It's sort of not known. So you get a sort of classical kind of body figure, very stripped down, without much in the way of accoutrements, a sort of robe that leaves the figure more exposed. The Indian figure has detail on it. The blanket, it has a beautiful medallion, the headdress has some detail in it. So the Indian figure is known in that sense. He was probably intended to represent a Plains Indian warrior. There's a kind of freedom of interpretation because it represents more than a single portrait. It's a composite of many tribes. The positive aspect of the statues is that it's done with great skill. The artist was very competent and knew how to show Roosevelt as the powerful figure by putting everybody else in his wake. Here was Theodore Roosevelt, great American figure, stalwart, riding on his horse. I mean, he's holding the horse, it's reined. It always to me seemed like a narrative of domestication, like the horse has been tamed, the Native American, the indigenous populations had been tamed. The conquest of the African continent was also about sort of taming the savage, right? The savage beast. And that was the narrative that was communicated to me. For an American Indian person looking at the monument, there's a, an experience of pain that comes with it. Indian figures sort of cast as this sort of vanishing, disappearing figure of the past. To see that representation and to understand that the representation has had all kinds of consequences, it's not a pleasant experience. I don't feel offended by the statue. I feel like they did something wrong with the statue. It's, it's not right. Maybe the intention had been to make awareness of Native Americans and Africans, but it just came off all wrong. It would have been better if the two guys were both on horses, because then it would have been like, we're all like equal and all the same. The sculptor, James Earl Fraser, I don't think he means a slight against Native America or Africa, but we are so distant from his mind as living cultures, where the symbols of primitivism, where the symbols of nature. I think their faces are dignified, but, you know, at what cost? Because, you know, they don't seem like free men. I see colonial power. The standing figures were taken to somehow be lesser than Roosevelt because he's on the horse and they're standing on the ground. That, of course, looks extremely prejudicial. That's how we would see it today. If we see it in the historical context and we see the two standing figures as having allegorical content, uh, both representing continents and representing figures who would have assisted Roosevelt on his hunt, then we see it in a different context. I think Fraser, as a sculptor, meant to depict them in a very sympathetic way, with dignity. You know, you don't see the cigar store um, Indian, as, as they were called. You don't see, you know, the comic African with the bone in his nose. It's a beautifully crafted 
work of art, but there's always an aesthetics to race. And back to the PowerPoint. Thank you for your patience during technological adjustment. Uh, David, can you confirm that the PowerPoint is up and functional now? Yes, it is. And did most of the video come through with the audio and the visual sync up? Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to offer six preliminary takeaways about what I'll refer to as TR, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, which is how I guess academics affectionately refer to the statue despite all of the difficulty that surrounds it. Uh, and so these preliminary takeaways are based on just exactly the same bit of material that you saw and the responses of the various people interviewed to it. Uh, and they don't reflect anything other than the kind of work uh, I did philosophically sitting there watching the video for the first time, as you have just done. Uh, so the first issue, almost everyone agrees that there's something problematic about the statue, though some guests at the museum don't seem to be at all bothered by this. For example, one person just sees it as a nice backdrop for selfies. And while this is a rather small point to get us started, I thought it raised a very general question for me, which is how are monuments or works of art used today in 2020? Now these days, the sense of wanting to be there in the physical space to drink in the presence and the detail of the thing is often diminished in favor of valorizing a virtual space captured on or generated by one's phone. So you see in the lower portion of the image here, uh, a new museum in California called the Museum of the Selfie. And of course, a riff on Mona Lisa, who's also taking picture of herself. In addition, uh, we now see a personal narrative of I was here, one that's often disassociated from history, taking precedence over slow savoring and interpretive reading of the work for many viewers. Now, while these facts about contemporary appreciative activities might be regarded by some as misfortunes to be overcome through various forms of art education, they are 21st century realities. So I think when considering the possibility of new monuments, the question of how they might be powerful both within one's personal virtual space as well as within the civic physical space should at least be raised. Second point, almost everybody interviewed so far agrees that TR is significant from the standpoint of its artistry. It shows great skill in the rendering and is noted to be impressive in its scale. But we should remember that this isn't the case with all monuments some of which do not display the kind of artistic acting in TR exhibits. Hence, one question to consider with respect to the controversial cases is whether the work actually has artistic or aesthetic value that must be weighed against other values, such as promoting historical understanding and facilitating cultural healing. Another related question might be whether any monuments should be removed or modified on purely aesthetic grounds, even if they don't provoke civic controversy or any kind of social unease. And I have uh, here on the left, a different kind of image, uh, again, very well wrought of Roosevelt on his horse, one that maybe would have been less controversial than the one outside the museum. And then on the right, a kind of series of notes to what um, America's eyesore is a, a very fun website that you can look up regards as uh, the sort of number one monument that ought to be removed on aesthetic grounds purely because actually the citizens love it and it serves a really great civic function and it's called the bull weevil monument and you'll find it in enterprise alabama it has the distinction of being the first and perhaps the only monument actually to uh, an architectural or agri agricultural pet um, but for various reasons, it also is a little bit less than perhaps aesthetically compelling. And so one might look at cases like this to ask whether there could be purely aesthetic reasons for wanting to remove monuments, and that could be a subject for a different conversation. Now getting a little bit more serious. One key assumption running throughout the conversation so far is that this statue is both a monument and a memorial. The terms are often used interchangeably by those who are interviewed. But is TR really a memorial? 
Now, it seems to me that a fundamental distinction between monuments and memorials is elided throughout the video, even, and to my surprise, by the museum curators, the art historians, and other academics. As art critic and philosopher Arthur Danto famously put it, we erect monuments so that we shall always remember and build memorials so that we shall never forget. Monuments commemorate the memorable and embody myths of beginning. Memorials ritualize remembrance and, remark and mark the reality of end. Hence, Danto recommends a functional distinction between the two while acknowledging that some monuments can also serve or can come over time to serve a memorializing goal. With this in mind, it seems to me that TR was clearly erected so that we should always remember the achievements of the 26th president, and that it clearly embodies the myth of a new beginning for conservation projects in America, as well as perhaps an additional myth about new beginnings for some social relationships. To continue this line, Marita Sturkin also notes the importance of distinguishing clearly between monuments and memorials in her entry on monuments in the Encyclopedia of Aesthetics. She writes, monuments are a means to honor the past, whereas memorials focus specifically on paying tribute to the dead. Memorials can take many forms, including specific days, but monuments are always concerned with the process of remembering. She also notes that memorials are often tied to naming, either directly or through implication, writing, monuments have a tendency to rely on abstract visual codes to convey their messages whereas memorials usually are more inscription and text driven. The narrative of loss seeming to need more explanation than the simple narrative of triumph. This is why, for instance, you often see thousands of names of the dead in war memorials, such as Maya Lin's famous Vietnam Veterans Memorial in DC, which is depicted here and about which uh, Danto is writing when he opens his essay with this particular famous quote. It is also why it makes sense to designate a street named after a deceased historic figure as a memorial way. Again, on Sturkin's version of the distinction, CR, TR seems clearly to be a monument rather than a memorial, especially insofar as it relies on abstract visual codes to convey its message, a fact that generates competing interpretations on the part of viewers. Now, why does this distinction really matter for TR or in other similar cases? I submit it's because there's a significant difference between honoring or paying tribute to the dead for their loss of life and valorizing an individual or group for some purported achievement or undertaking. As a result, it seems prima facie that a more rigorous case would need to be made for removing or replacing a memorial that marks an uncontested historical fact about death than for modifying sculptures or murals that function as monuments to past accomplishments or ideals, recognizing that qua monuments these may involve implicit judgment claims about historical events or engage in conscientious myth-making about new beginnings. It might also be important to note a distinction between a memorial and that which memorializes. After all, my photograph albums of travels with my husband memorialize these adventures in the sense that they enable me to recall our special moments abroad vividly and to time travel back to them in memory whenever I like. But in themselves, these picture books are not memorials to those times, nor to my husband, nor to our marriage, as they might be if I created a large scale collage or shrine, using them to inspire pensive reflection on some kind of loss, for example, the loss of my youth or the loss of our current ability to travel internationally. And finally, I think there's a further distinction to be marked between commemorative memorials or monuments which function as aid memoir, that is active reminders of things both good and bad, and celebratory memorials or monuments, that is those that honor people as heroes or outcomes as triumphs. So another issue and related to a key assumption that runs through several of the commentaries seems to go something like this. Because TR demonstrates significant artistic skill, it should be considered to be a work of public art. But, the philosopher asks, does it actually discharge the function, as Noel Carroll would put it, of a public artwork? Now, given that public art is a recognized genre of art in general, one with its own norms, history, and practices, we would first have to ask whether TR is a work of art at all. And on most philosophical accounts that seek to answer the general question what or when is art, the presence of skill and representational rendering would not be definitive 
given that evidence of such ability is never sufficient to, and might not even be necessary for, creating an artifact that is worthy of the descriptive title artwork. Now, while there is a common honorific use of the word to praise things that are exceptional exemplars of their kind, as in when I say to you, wow, that piece is really a work of art, or boy, that financial report was a real artwork, this common use of the term does not entail that the object so praised is among the world's art objects or is a legitimate candidate for arthood. That is, is an artifact that rightfully commands the attention of art historians, art critics, enthusiastic art appreciators, and even philosophers of art. So when we look to the paradigmatic cases of art objects, things typically referenced such as the Mona Lisa, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, Shakespearean sonnets and Michelangelo's Statue of David, in an attempt to determine what common feature or features they might share, in virtue of which they're all exemplars of a distinctive kind of artifact, do we find that skillful rendering or ability to manipulate physical materials as in the TR sculpture is the red thread that binds them together as art objects? Now, as some of you will know, the resounding answer from the philosophical community in at least the past six decades has been no. This may be a common feature of much beloved art, and it might even be a criterion of good art, but there are plenty, uncontest plenty of uncontested examples of artworks that do not display anything like this kind of skill, with Duchamp-style ready-mades and computer-generated artworks perhaps being the most obvious. And moving in the other direction, there are, of course, many items that do not call for artistic regard or evaluation, though they might be very aesthetically pleasing, that do exemplify the ability to produce finely wrought representations through handwork, such as the famous Ware collection of blush to glass models of plants, AKA the glass flower collection at Harvard, which is pictured here, which was created explicitly for the purpose of scientific study and still serves this primary function. So without devolving into a lengthy detour about the definition of art, it's clear that technical skill in rendering, even coupled with the ability to generate an emotional reaction in virtue of something's scale, cannot be the reason TR is a work of art if it is one. And it certainly isn't the reason that the piece is a work of public art if it's a member of that particular art category. Here again, we might find Danto helpful in his suggestion that a work of, quote, public art is the public transfigured. It is us in the medium of artistic transformation. That is, public art is only on display when a work is designed for a public and the relevant group sees themselves reflected in it in a manner that helps them constitute a collective identity, thereby transfiguring them into a community. Hence, Donto's characterization of public art includes a success criterion involving civic response. The artwork, belongs to the relevant group of people together, or brings the relevant group of people together in some set of shared values and experiences, or it fails to be public art. He offers this qualifier in order to distinguish clearly between the specialized art kind work of public art and other works of so-called fine art that might just happen to be exhibited in public spaces, but that were never designed to fulfill anything uh, like a unifying or broader social function. So what is useful, though complicating, is that we now have in hand four categories to consider when we address any given case of a constitutional structure. Monument, memorial, work of art, and work of public art. At this preliminary juncture, I think TR status as an artwork is unclear, or at least might warrant some discussion. However, if it is a work of art, then, as Richard Serra argued in defense of his famously divisive public artwork, Tilted Art, to remove it from its original location might be tantamount to destroying it qua artwork, even if one goal of that removal is preservation of the statue that embodies the artwork at a given time. And this is because TR was designed to function as an artwork in a particular architectural and civic setting, and it gets some of the aesthetic and expressive properties it has, perhaps some essential properties that constitute it as a numer numerically unique artwork, from being located in that very space. Or, at least, this is a possibility to consider when weighing the benefits and costs of removal. If an impugned public sculpture is a work of art, is it also a site creation such that removal or relocation has significant ontological consequences? So the fifth point that emerged for me uh, is related to this one. Um, 
One thing that struck me was that the crucial differences in people's reactions to CR were interpretive in nature, even between those who had significant historical context within which to view the work, that is, the putative experts rather than the man on the street or woman or child on the street uh, who was interviewed. Some of the experts read it as a literal representation and others as an allegory, which has tremendous interpretive significance since members of the latter group can see the piece as friendly despite its blatant hierarchical physical structure, while members of the former may be able to read it only or primarily as a depiction of domination or domestication. Now, one reason to think that TR might be a work of art is that it does seem designed to invite some degree of interpretation. Even if it wears its status as a monument on its sleeve, the precise nature of what is being honored or valorized remains unclear from the physical features of the statue itself, even in situ. That opacity invites art historical reading, which may well conflict with one another. And to go back to the previous point, this is one of the paradigmatic features of works of art, or is one of the functions artworks typically discharge. So questions of interpretive intentions will loom large, both with respect to the work's appropriate classification, as already noted, and with respect to its meaning. Which leads us to the last set of reflections I have on that preliminary set of interviews. There seems to be a general sentiment that the creator's intentions misfired somehow. They meant to do something for the public good, but things just went horribly wrong somewhere along the way. For me, this raises the question, who really was the creator or author of this work? Was it John Russell Pope, the designer and American architect who also drew up plans for the building and other works of art within it? Or was it James Earl Fraser, the statue sculptor? Or was it both together? Or was it some broader collective, including perhaps the New York State Legislature who originally approved the project in 1920? And whoever the makers were, what were their actual intentions? Better yet, are these even relevant to the meaning of the work as a public icon in the way authorial intentions might be important to or constitutive of the meaning of a T.S. Eliot poem or a puzzling Roscoe canvas? So the interpretive task is complicated in this particular case by the fact that the creation of the work was broadly speaking collaborative, coupled with the fact that we have slightly competing accounts from Pope the designer and Fraser the sculpture about what the work was meant to signify or do. So here's what the architect said. Pope proposes, quote, in the center of the terrace will arise a polished granite pedestal bearing an equestrian statue of Roosevelt with two accompanying figures on foot, one representing the American Indian and the other the primitive African. This heroic group will symbolize the fearless leadership, the explorer, benefactor, and educator. And this is uh, the description of the design that was ultimately approved by the Memorial Commission in 1921. Now, Pope's description does emphasize the idea that the entire group is meant to be heroic, but it also suggests an intention to elevate Roosevelt as benefactor to and educated of the heroes by his side. Not to mention that Pope refers to the African figure as deliberately designed to be primitive in appearance. By contrast, Frazier reported uh, after the statue was unveiled in 1940, the two figures at Roosevelt's side are guides, symbolizing the continents of Africa and America. And if you choose, may stand for Roosevelt's friendliness to all races. Frazier's brief remark emphasizes the potentially allegorical nature of the work, which isn't mentioned by Pope, and construes the standing figures as guides or leaders rather than students or beneficiaries. He also emphasizes TR's open-ended interpretive texture, allowing that an audience member, if you choose, may see it as standing for Roosevelt's friendliness to all races, though this reading is not required on his time. In addition, Fraser emphasized that the form of the piece is based on a 1495 equestrian statue by Andrea del Barocchio, thereby giving the work a specific art historical reference that is no part of any of Pope's descriptions. So an important thing to keep in mind here is that this is a common feature of monuments that are controversial, most of which are the product of many creative hands as well as collective decision-making by local leaders and other financiers. And perhaps questions about authorship are not as pressing in the cases of public art as they are with respect to typical fine art products. After all, as philosopher Albert Noe remarks in a 2017 NPR article entitled, What Really Is a Monument? Quote, to destroy a Leonardo is to hurt Leonardo's legacy. 
to damage our grasp on his historical situation. But to destroy a monument to Robert E. Lee is to hurt his legacy, not that of the responsible artist. And it is to alter our felt relation to his time and place, rather than the time and place of the manufacturer of his memorial. And I should just note that Noe makes this last point explicitly because the vast majority of Confederate monuments were erected decades after the end of the Civil War during the Jim Crow era. Noe continues, quote, there are all sorts of exceptions to these generalizations, referring to a long discussion he's had about the distinction between works of public art and monuments. And there may be all manner of ambiguities, end quote. So I suppose it might be the primary aim of my reflections today to illustrate or bring forth some of these for further examination by you, my interlocutor. But even acknowledging the messiness of the civil conceptual arena to the extent that they bear on our best or most accurate or most appropriate interpretations, admitting that these can be multiple, decision makers need to confront the question of what artistic history or understanding might be affected by disassociating public works from their makers, and, in some cases, from their specific context of creation, to read them always both with contemporary eyes and or as a reflection only on their memorialized subjects. We would not typically advocate this approach to other kinds of art objects, is it justified in this case, and if so, for what reason? In other words, what makes public artistic rendering special and especially immune from so-called intentionalist interpretation, if indeed they are? Now, thus far, I've raised a series of questions about the first half of the film. Now, in watching the second half, I invite you to do the same, following your own philosophical notes. I do, however, encourage some reflection on the following issues, should you be interested in any. So first, what options are there other than straightforward removal? Uh, and just so you know, I have a list of at least 10 here, but I'd be really excited to hear what your ideas might be. Second, is there an important difference between commissioned one-off works and those created in a foundry with regard either to their aesthetic or their historical value? And this gets back to the point I raised earlier about the relevance or irrelevance of monument makers. Third, what should we make of the pedestals versus the monuments themselves, which often were created by different people, sometimes at different times, using different funds and in different parts of the country? For example, some of the pedestals of the Confederate monuments were actually made in New England. Does it matter who procured or provided the funds for a monument originally? And my final big two, why should we assume that monuments must be permanent and unchanging? And what would it look like to create ephemeral and or participatory monuments? And finally, what do you make of the repeated references to erasing history, which is a refrain commonly heard in discussions about these issues? For example, would the relocation of TR actually produce such an epistemic outcome? And so we now move into the second film portion of our presentation, taking just a moment to make the technological transition. Or two, maybe three. Roosevelt was seen as a champion of uh, conservationist science. Conservationism gave us uh, our national park system, and Roosevelt's probably best remembered for that. Most people don't know that a lot of these national parks were made possible by the evacuation of indigenous populations. Roosevelt says something like this, I'm not going to go so far as to say that the only good Indian is a dead Indian, but in nine of ten cases, I believe that to be the case, and in the tenth case, well, you know. So you couldn't call him a friend of the Indian. I would absolutely call um, Theodore Roosevelt a racist. His views on race come out of his class position, come from a certain moment where that particular class had an extraordinary amount of wealth and power at the turn of the 20th century. You have to look at people at their time period. And Theodore Roosevelt, 1901 to 1909, if you're comparing him, he was quite enlightened. 
and he invited Booker T. Washington to the White House, and this created a huge outrage. Never before had an African American sat in the White House, and TR got hammered for this. After his presidency, Theodore Roosevelt goes to Africa. Who else in America was doing that? On the other hand, he was an imperialist figure there. When you read some of his writings, you cringe because it has such a feeling of white supremacy. It shows a portrait of somebody feeling that tribal people of Africa are not very high on his Darwinian scale. He had very specific views around which races, the Nordic, the Alpine, were going to lead civilization forward. And then there were those that you didn't want to mate with. Roosevelt was very much a part of that debate around whether or not you could actually breed better humans. This field's called eugenics, which also became very popular. The American Museum of Natural History was also involved in this misguided movement, hosting two conferences with displays in the 1920s and 1930s. You can take your pick of American presidents who have perpetuated theories of racial segregation and racial subordination. He wouldn't be the first that would come to mind. But the placement of the statue, the existence of the monument, the dialogue that it generates with the public, combined with the colonial framing of the museum itself, is what makes it distinctive. And that's what makes it so problematic. I've been here for parts of five decades. And in every one of those decades, we've had protests against the TR statue. The political reality is that that statue is where it is because that's where the state of New York wanted it. I think uh, statues should be where they are. Should this be on the main street? Should this be in the front of the museum? No, I will put a dinosaur uh, <laughs> over here. Something, anything else but this. I leave it up for sure. They're still a part of history. I don't believe they should be destroyed, but I definitely think they should be taken down. Leave it as it is, and let it, you know, let it represent the time that it was made, and we know better now. I think I would, I would move it inside the museum and put something else here. I don't know if it necessarily needs to be taken down because if we, if we take it down, then we erase what happened and we cannot really erase what happened. We've just got to like be able to move forward. In 2017, the mayor of New York formed a commission to examine troubling monuments throughout the city. But the commission was unable to come to a consensus on what to do about the Roosevelt statue. The mayor decided the statue would remain with additional context and the possibility of adding new works of art. I voted to remove the statue. I thought it should be removed elsewhere on grounds, not be removed entirely, but moved elsewhere and then contextualized. I personally would be opposed to removing things. I think it's better to expand the people that are being honored in our public spaces. I would remove it from public view. I think it would be a long overdue act of racial healing in this city. I don't think it deserves to really occupy that prominent position any longer. I'm not inclined to tear things down because I really sincerely believe it erases history. And history is hard and unpleasant, but um, we need to talk about it. I think it's wonderful that there is a conversation about what we're seeing because there are so many different views now and I think the conversation can change because of education and what we hope for in the future. So, I mean, that's the power of sculpture, <laughs> says the sculptor. <laughs> Museums should not simplify stories, we should complicate them. Teddy Roosevelt deserves to be memorialized for his contributions to conservation. We should also acknowledge his race politics. These were complicated figures. It's not an attack on the legacy of Roosevelt, but it is a request that we think about what we put on display in light of what we 
do and how we think and how we feel in the, in the present moment. Let's think about sort of ways in which we commemorate, but also look to the future. Now that our politics are becoming more diverse, people are asking, can we have different representations of people and events um, and histories, not a single history, but multiple histories and monuments and markers in the United States, I think, can speak to those multiple histories. Okay, final technical transition. Actually, David, I don't think we need to do that. I'm gonna leave the, the screen off now so I can see all of the participants who remain and just make a couple of very brief closing remarks before I invite you to move on to your comments and impressions. So as I said in the beginning, I'm primarily interested in two questions that arise only after public artifacts have been modified by citizens' hands. First, what should we do with the altered representations once they've been changed physically and expressively? And second, how should we regard the family of practices associated with American monument making going forward? The issues specific to those two questions have not been directly addressed here, as we're just laying the groundwork for taking them up with rigor and seriousness. But in closing, I'll tip my hand, and I'll say that I'm interested in the ways an altered monument becomes a new kind of work once citizens have laid their hands on it. And I'm not entirely clear that the best option is always erasing the new messaging or removing the modified piece, since that seems to undermine or attempt to undo the rebirthed kind of public structure it has become. I'm also optimistic that today's thinking about monuments will result in things other than figurative representations of people on horses, since it seems clear to me that our nation has moved on from the romantic artistic ideals that motivated this kind of monument making in the past. So we need new monuments for a new time. Those that take up the uglier aspect of our history honestly without disenfranchising any of its citizens, as well as those that unite all of us in some form of fellow feeling or shared ideals as challenging as that might be. And while this is no easy or small task, I am hopeful that the kind of artistic creativity characteristic of works like those created in Philadelphia with the support of Monument Lab, and I showed you one of them earlier, as well as those that have become iconic representations of place throughout the city of Chicago, such as the untitled Picasso and Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate, will help lead the way, especially because Many of these have themselves been the subject of aesthetic and public controversy, which they have somehow managed to outlive, and in so doing have become transformed from divisive structures to emblems of Chicago and its citizens. And one final postscript on TR. While it was originally saved by New York's mayor when the commission could not decide what to do with it in 2017, as of June 2020, it's slated to be removed. Details about what comes next? TBA. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, thank you very much, Renee. Um, so uh, I don't see any comments in the chat yet. So if you have a comment or a question, please. Uh, oh, I, now I do see one. I see one from uh, Kathy Tobin, who says, there are so many statues you could have chosen for your focus, but I love that you chose this one, as there is so much to be considered. Um, so thank you for that, Kathy. And then if others of you have comments or questions, please do put them in the chat and we can address them. Just while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of things. Uh, in the video, uh, one of the speakers tried to paraphrase from memory a quotation from Roosevelt, and I looked it up, so I want to give the exact rendering. Uh, Roosevelt, in, a, in an 1886 speech in New York, said the following, I don't go so far as to think that the only good Indian is the dead Indian, but I believe nine out of every 10 are, and I shouldn't like to inquire too closely into the case of the 10th. So I just wanted to, uh, to get that out there. And then I'll just make one other comment just uh, uh, to throw into the hopper. Some of you may be aware of this, that this summer, a statue of Frederick Douglass was torn down in uh, Rochester. And uh, I don't know if they ever solved who was behind it, but there was a lot of conjecture that it was retaliation for the um, sculptures of, um, of uh, Confederate generals and whatnot being torn down in the uh, South. Okay, I see a question from Janusz. 
as we are entering a new period of the code, the references to the code that was oh, that restricted American filmmaking beginning circa 1934. Are we entering a new period of the code? Great. I actually would like to hear a bit more from Yanush on that, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, Yanush, what what comparison are, are you making specifically uh, here? What are you thinking? Uh, well, uh, those of you who are um, fans of old films probably have noticed how different the films are from the very early 1930s and from the films that started around 1934 when they imposed the code, which was essentially censorship. And, um, and the reason they uh, brought in that censorship was the same reason that we had prohibition, that there were people who found that they were offended and so they would deny expression that came naturally to others so that they wouldn't be offended. And that lasted for several decades. And it was really striking how fresh the films were before the cold. And then they lost that freshness. And are we entering a, a period of, of uh, where we have to conform to the sort of lowest common denominator that won't offend anybody and will lack any sort of authenticity? Um, I remember just, just a few months ago, Dan and I were watching a film from 1930 and someone showed the finger. You wouldn't show that in the late 1930s. It was very refreshing because it showed that people actually did that back then, rather than this artificial picture that the Hollywood started to create with the code. So my concern is that we're entering a new period of sort of oppressive censorship of the mediocre middle. Uh, good. So I, I would just maybe make two quick comments. One is the reason that I posted up uh, an image from Monument Lab in Philadelphia, is I think that your concern might be ameliorated if you look at the very creative ways in which people are trying to figure out, first of all, how to deal with these uh, works that are creating a, a public unease that poses a, a safety issue, really, right? That I mean, Lightfoot removed the statues, not because she had a particular historic uh, thought about them or aesthetic thought about them, but because they, at the time, she was concerned that they posed a kind of safety hazard. Mm -hmm. And so um, the really creative ways, like flanking one of these things in an all mirrored box, that people are dealing both with the transition and thinking also about um, what monuments could look like in future, which I think does include more of a reflection on the possibility of them being ephemeral, being uh, changing, being things that monument appreciators can contribute to, maybe also having a connection to the virtual space. So I don't think that we're entering a period of censorship necessarily, but I think it is a clear uh, creative call that artists and uh, thinkers in this realm are trying to uh, respond to. How can we make artworks that, that, that would be fresh in our time? And they maybe don't have to be assumed to be uh, worthwhile monuments for thousands of years, because maybe that idea uh, of monumentalization uh, has proved to be more difficult in the in the public sphere. That doesn't mean that you still wouldn't have such things in museums. It doesn't mean that private people who are making works that aren't paid for with public dollars wouldn't have as much free expression as possible. And I think that's one of the important things to distinguish here. That's why Danto draws a distinction between works of public art and works of fine art in public spaces because he thinks they fulfill different functions and also the artists who create them have different obligations. Um, so I'm not entirely worried about censorship, but I do think you're right. That is the question. How do we respond in a way that keeps things honest and invigorated um, and that, that doesn't become restrictive in, um, in concerning sorts of manners? Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other comments in the chat. I want to, again, in, in, invite that. If you have any comments, please put them on in the chat, comments or questions. I um, guess I have a question for the group, um, sure. which is why is it hard to ask a question? Um, there were so many things. I think one of, and it might be this, there were so many things in those videos that showed a variety of perspectives from people of all walks of life and all ages in different places that metabolizing that much content that quickly, I think is, is quite challenging. So, I mean, I apologize uh, if that's the case, 
but I really would invite any reflections you had, even and in particular on this assessing or addressing the statue project, which was an attempt to do something other than remove the statue and give it a kind of contextual discussive environment. And that's how all these interviews happened. And I thought it was an interesting approach at attempting to get a conversation going um, where they didn't yet have any commissions to put new uh, artworks on either side of the museum memorial, which was really, I think, what um, the commission thought would happen originally. Uh, and, and now that statue's been removed. Go ahead, Janusz, feel free. Well, one thing that occurred to me was the discussion of what is art in our intro to great issues, at least the way I teach it. We have a, uh, we have a little section on um, what is beauty and what is art. And you brought that issue up. And as soon as you brought it up, I got sort of a flinch of pain uh, because it's such a difficult issue. Um, what is art? I know, for instance, my parents had very traditional views. And I remember my mother telling me that her second graders painted better than Picasso. And that prejudiced me against Picasso for the rest of my life. And then when I saw the Picasso in Chicago, I thought that was the head of a woman. Uh, it's not a head of a woman, but a head of a horse rather than a woman. And it yeah. took me a couple of decades to get over that sort of, uh, that sort of prejudice. So there's this, uh, so how would you define art? I absolutely will not do that here in this context. <laughs> Um, but what I will say is that it is, um, of course, a vexed question. I think it's a completely separate question from questions about what beauty is or what aesthetic value is. Mm. Uh, and so running those together um, is sort of what I was suggesting might be problematic, but it's very, very natural. So it's very natural to look at something that's as well hewn as, and as artistic, right? Has all these artistic properties or demonstrates great artistry and skill and say, oh, well, in virtue of that, it must be a work of art. And all I wanted to suggest was, if it is one, that's not the reason. Uh, and there might be other reasons. And what surprised me in learning about the statue was that it was at least to some degree intentionally designed to be interpretively opaque. And that seems to be closer to the kinds of, um, one, one of the very frequently distinctive features of something that's a work of art, as opposed to just a beautifully artistic rendering. Um, but it's a complicated issue. I'll just say that in the last 60 years, and we can thank Danto, I think, for, for a lot of this, the uh, idea that works of art have uh, perceptually identifiable features that will tell you in advance of knowing more about their history and context and the institution in which they function uh, was, has, has been left behind, right? Almost nobody thinks I could determine if something was, was a work of art merely by looking at it. I would have to have a lot of contextual information um, about it. And I think that is also relevant to this discussion about these monuments. What role do we find them playing in our society once we have more contextual information about them? And I don't think uh, I have a full sense of the context of this particular complex case at all, right? I, I think if I were on the commission trying to decide, I would need months and months uh, to learn an awful lot more about the history of the statue um, and the, the players involved. Um, uh, Renee, there's a question from Eugene. Uh, he says, uh, TR was advanced for his time and unacceptable in ours. For example, he famously called Filipinos, quote, our little brown brothers. We cringe at the little while his contemporaries were outraged by the brothers. <laughs> How do we balance in our public works lauding pioneers with advancing our enlightened judgments? So Eugene, I'm going back to the caveat I mentioned at the beginning, which is I am not here today to make recommendations about what we ought to do with public art. I'm only suggesting that people on these commissions need to take these kinds of considerations and others like them very seriously. So again, I'm going to sidestep this question. But one thing I will say I've been thinking about that I'm very worried about is what I'm worried will be the, the cult of placification, right? That what we'll try to do to contextualize some of the monuments that uh, we have good reason to maintain, but they, we need to have more information about them for them to discharge their public functions well, or their historical functions well, is that we'll just start putting up markers and plaques all around them with more and more textual information. Um, and just to go back to the original picture I have of the people taking selfies in front of monuments, let's be honest, 
no, not not nobody, but many, many people are not reading those. So it seems to me like the right way to balance this kind of thing in terms of contextualizing the work certainly isn't just going to be to put up plaques uh, that show, oh, but they were really advanced for their time. It might be to make um, counter artworks uh, or to have public presentations, dramatic represent presentations happening in the space. And so again, I would um, encourage you to look at Monument Lab in Philadelphia because there are just a ton of creative ways they're thinking exactly about this, this problem. Um, and I would also just invite you, Eugene, to tell me what you think, because I know you've got a thought. Eugene, if you can unmute yourself, uh, you've been invited to address this. I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, the, the question in part goes to what is the function of public works, right? Uh, because there are several functions, that, just among those you mentioned, conflicting in, in the question, right? Uh, part of it is to express um, the ethos of our community as a community. Right? That's at least one common function of public works. Right? Um, we also, uh, as Rondo pointed out, we also uh, reconceptualize ourselves through interacting with the works. We also uh, use public works to remember uh, where we've been and what we've been through. And that's only three of many functions. And I guess one of the things about, one of the questions I was raising is how do we balance conflicting functions in our public works? Because it seems to be often the convert, not always, right? But often controversies about these public works are controversies about stressing different functions. Mm -hmm. The defenders will stress one function, uh, those protesting will stress another, and they're both legitimate functions. Right. I think the one of the, as I just mentioned earlier, one of the common things that people seem to be discussing today as a practical attempt to balance this problem, which, um, you know, can't be the idealized version we would like to have in philosophical reflection, it is to create um, counter or responsive activities or opportunities or monuments that demonstrate the other important function that maybe the monument didn't manage to pull off so well for everyone or wasn't able to pull off so well for everyone without further understanding that it's multifaceted or could be multifaceted in that, those ways. So I think that most of the discussions I've heard, and I, I listened to four uh, papers at the American Society of Aesthetics last week, three papers from uh, two leading members of the American Historical Association, six talks from people at MPAC and Monument Labs, just as I was thinking about this issue, most people are in favor of some kind of additive, right? To bring about, to bring about attention to or bring awareness to the multiplicity of functions uh, or the variety of stories or the fact that you know, we have a, uh, something that appears to be lauding uh, an individual who seems to have uh, qualities that aren't being lauded in this particular monument uh, that we would revile. And I think it's been said in every single one of those 10 or 12 things I've listened to lately, um, we shouldn't think of memorials that have been erected already that honor people as honoring absolutely everything about the person. Because as one historian from Harvard said, look, you give me five minutes and I can find out something about your past that's going to look really awful if we think of that as being associated with everything else um, that's related to what we might honor you for. So people are messy and we should sort of be humble in the face of that and not assume that every memorial to an individual is memorializing all aspects of the individual. That having been said, it seems to me another thread that keeps coming up in addition to this recontextualization 
is that in new projects, we might be better off uh, not creating statues to individuals, uh, but instead creating monuments of various kinds to ideas, or as you said earlier, ideals or shared ethos or events, because it seems to be the monuments to the individuals um, that at this time are particularly problematic. So that's just a common thread that I've heard in these conversations. I don't think anybody has any definitive answers. That's why the thought experiment is powerful. What would you do if you were on a Chicago commission right now? What would you ask them to attend to as they're doing their work? Um, Renee, there's another question in the chat. Uh, this is from Zachary who writes, I was wondering about the idea of historical erasure brought up by several people and its relation to the accuracy of the depiction of Roosevelt I believe it was the sculptor that said the statue could represent Theodore's quote friendliness to all races end quote when in fact his actions and statements would prove otherwise is there an ethical question of the accuracy of who or what we are uh, monumentalizing and memorializing and could the statue at least in intention be erasing the more problematic aspects of TR so I think this is precisely why originally their work about this particular statue, they fully anticipated that several more works of art would um, emerge and be placed on the set around him. Just so that the complexity of the story and the complexity of who TR really was, uh, was not erased by a kind of monumentalizing, uh, especially right the hierarchical structure of the image. Um, is there an ethical question? I mean, there is an ethical question here, but I think this comes back to the more fundamental question about what's the difference between public art and fine art? What's the difference between monuments, public monuments and memorials and public art? And what are the responsibilities of the artists and those people who work on these projects? Um, again, I went to a number of sessions on this. The artists take very seriously a number of ethical considerations when they engage in these projects. I'm not sure whether that was true uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I think it was an honor to be asked to participate. I don't know if there was a kind of code of ethics and, uh, and that the conversation was as robust. But at least in my optimistic looking forward, I will say that that exact issue is something, um, Zach, that artists are, are worried about and thinking about along with people who figure out how to fund and when to fund and which things to fund, which is always a back set of questions. Uh, thank you very much, Renee. I, I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat, and it is 4.45, so maybe we should think about concluding. Is that okay? Thank you to all who hung in there. I know that was a, a long one and lots in it, so I appreciate it, and I wish all of you a really wonderful evening and a happy holiday season, because it's just upon us. So I just want to echo that. Uh, thank you, Renee, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you to all of you who came. Be on the lookout. There will be more philosophy events in the spring. I hope you all can come back for those. And again, thank you. Uh, take care, everyone.